I'm good. I brought lots of stuff, and I've got lots of stuff to show you. So we're going to jump right in by starting talking about what we talked about last week. So just to kind of recap, last week we did three different models of the Earth and the Moon system. We talked about the size model, which you can kind of see here, where the Moon is one-fourth the size of the Earth. Then we did a distance model where we pulled that distance on a string out in the hallway, and what we found was that distance is a lot bigger than what we thought it was. It's actually nine and a half times the distance at the equator. So we pulled that string and we saw how far that is. The third model was actually the motion model. This was the model where we were rotating and revolving in the hallway. And what we saw was it creates this phenomenon where only one side of the moon faces the Earth at all times. And we call that a synchronous orbit because the moon's rotation and its revolution happen in about the same amount of time. They're kind of synced together because of the gravity between the Earth and the moon. So now we're going to take kind of those three models and let's see if what type of effects it has on Earth. So before we start looking at this model, I want to kind of briefly review some things that I expect you to probably kind of know from elementary school. Let's look at some moons. So I've got a couple of images here. This is a new moon and a full moon. This might be kind of hard for you to see, but you can just make out the ring around the moon there. He's almost completely dark. And then that's a full moon. Next, we're looking at a quarter moon. A quarter moon looks like a half moon. But what we're going to see today is that it's actually a quarter because a half of a half mathematically is a quarter. So what we're actually seeing is a quarter of the moon here. And then we're going to look at crescent moons and gibbous moons. Crescent moons are the ones that are just a tiny little sliver of light peeking out. And then a gibbous moon looks very similar to a full moon. He's just missing the edge in the darkness right there where he's not quite full. So we could kind of say that like crescent moons and gibbous moons are opposites because one of them is just a little bit of light and more darkness and the other one is the opposite where we have more of the lit portion and then just a tiny sliver of darkness on the corner. So I want to pose a scenario with you. I did this um, as Bell worked with my students this week on Google Classroom and then compiled their data so that we'll be able to talk about some of their answers as well. I thought it might be kind of interesting um, for you to know what students your age right here in your district responded to this question. So let's look at it. Chinese moon. It says, Belinda lives in St. Louis, Missouri. She looked up at the sky one evening and observed a crescent moon. What if her friend Lin, who lives in Beijing, China, looked up at the moon on the same night? What type of moon would Lin in China see? And then it gives you choices, a crescent moon, a quarter moon, a gibbous moon, a full moon, or a new moon. And so you kind of got to think about, hmm, what do I know? I know that Missouri is in the United States, and I know that China is on the opposite side of the earth. So these two kids are on opposite sides of the planet and looking up at the moon at night. If one of them sees a crescent, what will the other see? So these are some responses I got out of my students. I had one student say, um, I guessed, but I made this guess because I thought maybe since it's on a different side, it would be that moon. So this student was thinking it was something other than the crescent. Then I have another one saying, I think it's flipped because they're on opposite sides of the earth, so it would be opposite sides of the moon. Then another student says, because the view of the moon would, moon would be different on the other side of the world. And then I had another student say, I think gibbous because since they're on opposite sides of the world, they see opposite phases of the moon. So by and large, when I compiled this data, the majority of the students said that they think it's a crescent moon, that it's going to be the same moon. And then the second most popular answer was this one, where they think it's a gibbous moon. If it's crescent on this side of the earth, then it's going to be gibbous on the other side of the earth. This is a common misconception. The correct answer is a crescent moon. 
the moon is going to be the same no matter where you are on earth. I think that this misconception oftentimes comes from a confusion of phenomena. Week one, we talked about seasons. And we said that the northern hemisphere has opposite seasons than the southern hemisphere. And then when we start talking about phases of the moon, sometimes you think back to that. And you're like, oh, well, if it was opposite with the sun and the earth, then it's probably going to be opposite with the moon and the earth. But that's not true. When we look at the model and we see the eight different positions of phases of the moon, and we know that this orbit, if we look at this model, what this is showing, each one of these moons represents a different position in the moon's orbit around the earth. When you first look at it, it almost looks like the earth has eight moons, but we know that's not true. The earth has one moon and her name is Luna. So what we're modeling here is the movement of that one moon around the earth. This takes about 29 days. And then it takes about 28 days for it to uh, rotate on its axis. Well, if it takes 29 days for this one moon to make this entire orbit, if you do the math, 29 days, and there are eight different positions, you can see that it takes three to four days for it to change phases of the moon. So if two people are looking at the moon on the same night, even if they're on different sides of the planet, they're going to see the same moon because it takes a few days for the moon to make it shift to the next phase. So I want us to kind of focus on this model today. We've got an idea of what these different phases of the moon look like. The from the tiny crescent to the new moon to the full moon. But now the big question for us in sixth grade is why does the moon change? Why does it look different? What is the cause of this phenomena? So what we've done is I've put this model together. This is an AM style lesson and this is something we normally do in the classroom and kids are able to shine the flashlight and see and create the phases of the moon. And when you create them, it's very easy to see what the cause is. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to model the things that you would normally be doing in the classroom. I want you to notice a couple things about this model first, though. Remember, this standard is all about modeling the sun, earth, and the moon system. And in order for us to see causation, then <clears throat> we have to make sure we have everything in the model correct. So I want you to notice first, in this model, the moons are all different heights. The reason they're on different length pegs is to represent the actual tilt of the orbit. So when we're talking about space, we always have to kind of get out of our heads that everything is very linear and lined up perfectly straight. Stuff is at all kind of angles. So we have the tilt of the earth at 23 and a half degrees, and then we have the plane of the orbit of the moon that's also tilted. That's going to matter next week when we start looking at other effects of the moon. So um, I'm going to remove the earth from the center just because I don't want him to get in the way of our model. Um, look, first thing we're going to look at is where does the light from the moon come from? So let's go ahead and kill the lights. And let's see what we can see. So in this model, my flashlight is representing the sun because that's where all of the light comes from. The moon does not create its own light. It's only a big hunk of space rock that's orbiting Earth. So it does not produce light any more than Earth produces light. It only reflects light from the sun. So in this model, I'm going to use a flashlight to model the sun. So I want you to notice something. I'm going to hold this up just a little because I want you to be able to look at the top of the moon. If you can see the top of the moon, half of the moon is lit and half of it is in the shadow. This front part of the moon that's facing the sun is completely lit. 
The back part that's not facing the sun is in the darkness. It's half lit. At this position, it's the same thing. The sun is coming from the same direction. So there is still half a lit moon. At this position, it's the same thing. Half of the moon is always lit. As I work my way around the progression, what I want you to realize is because the sunlight is always coming from the same direction, half the moon is always lit. When I say that the moon is coming, I mean that the sunlight is coming from the same direction, what I mean by that is from the inside. The earth is orbiting the sun. So the sunlight is always coming from the inside of the orbit because it's the center point of the orbit. So what we've just established is always, no matter what, if it's a crescent moon, if it's a gibbous moon, if it's a full moon, if it's a new moon, no matter what, half of the moon is always lit. What phase it is is simply the dynamics of how much of that lit half can we see. So I'm going to come back here now. and rotate this around and I'm actually going to move I don't want these other moons to get in the way of what we're able to see so we're going to work with just one moon now so the Sun coming from this position shining on this moon we cannot see any of the lit half if the earth is in the center here what we see is the dark portion of the moon with no light showing. That's called a new moon. In a few days, when the moon gets to this position, now you should be able to see a tiny sliver You should be able to see a tiny sliver. We good there? All right, guys, bear with me. We're doing the best to make this show up. So you should be able to see a tiny sliver of light. That's going to be the crescent moon. Now I'm going to rotate this again. After a crescent moon, we're going to have a quarter moon. You should see half a line right there where one side is lit and the other side is not. You able to see? Let's rotate one more time. Good? All right, I'm going to move him again. We're going to rotate another time. Normally, when I do this in class, Students are moving around this board and finding this, them, this themselves. So this is a little bit different for us doing it this way. All right, so now we should be able to see most. Do we see just the, are we missing just the tiniest sliver over here? Most of the moon should be lit. This is our gibbous moon. So we went from a new moon with no light to a crescent moon with just a tiny sliver of light, to a quarter moon where we saw half of the light, to the gibbous moon where we see almost all of the light. The next phase as we rotate is a full moon. You should be able to see the entire lit portion here. This is the opposite position of new moon because now the dark side is facing away from us and we see the entire lit portion. We're going to rotate again. I'm going to stop right here and ask you to kind of think, make a prediction. We went from no light with a new moon to then just a tiny little sliver of a crescent moon to seeing a quarter of the light, a quarter of the moon, to seeing a gibbous moon to a full moon. What is this moon going to be? It was just full. Let's see. So now, 
we should see most of it missing a tiny portion on the side, on this side. That's it. Can you see the dark portion on this very, very far side? So this is a gibbous. So I want you to notice something because most likely what this may look like on a test for you because you can't create this diagram at home, most likely doing a sketch diagram or labeling a diagram would be the way this information would be tested. So I want you to notice something. This was full moon and then we had a gibbous. And what was right before the full moon? A gibbous. So when we look at this on a diagram, you're going to have gibbous moons on both sides of the full moon. So we had our gibbous. So now let's rotate around here. And we're back to a quarter. What you may notice is that it's the opposite lit side. A quarter moon is always half of the lit portion because like I said, a half of a half is a quarter. Sometimes this is called third quarter. Sometimes this is called last quarter. Both are correct. Those two are synonymous. Um, they're synonyms. It could be third quarter or last quarter depending on what you're looking at. So now let's get to this one. And we should see just a small portion of the lit and more shadow over here. And we're going to get to the last position. So this is where we started. And it gets us back to the new moon position. Where now all we have is the complete dark side of the moon and we don't say any of the lit portion of the moon. Awesome. All right, so let's chat about what we just saw for a minute. If we want to come back on with the lights now, that's fine with me. And let's chat about this and make some points here. So there are eight phases of the moon. There are two gibbous moons. There are two crescent moons. There are two quarter moons. And there's a full moon and a new moon. What you should notice here is from the new moon, all the way to the full moon, the lit portion is getting bigger. We see a little bit more of the light and a little bit more of the light and a little bit more of the light and a little bit more of the light until we see all of the light. And then as it works its way back around, we see a little bit less of the light and a little bit less of the light and a little bit less of the light and a little bit less of the light until we see none of the light at all. So there's a vocabulary for that. When we talk about the moon gaining lit portion, we call that waxing. If the moon appears to be getting larger, we're seeing more and more of that lit portion, then we say that it is waxing. If it's getting smaller, we're coming from a full moon and we're getting a little bit less light and a little bit less light and a little bit less light and a little bit less light, bit less light then we say that's waning. Now, my students know that oftentimes I like to think of um, just crazy things to help me remember. In this one, what we normally say is wax on, wane off. Wax on, wane off. If it's waxing, the lip portion is growing. If it's waning, the lip portion is getting smaller. I got two more vocabulary words I want to throw at you real quick. I want you to notice because the orbit is elliptical, there are places in this orbit where the moon is closer or the moon is further away. I'm going to tilt this up a little bit. Hopefully you can see this elliptical orbit. And these two positions are further away from the Earth than these two positions. We call this apogee and perigee. This is how you remember it. The two positions where the moon is closer to the Earth is perigee. Think of the word pair. If two things are paired together, then they're close together. So perigee means the moon is closest to the earth. Apogee, think of the word apart. If things are apart, there's a greater distance. So apogee means the moon is in its further position. The phenomena this causes on earth is 
the moon seems to change size. At apogee, when the moon is furthest away, the moon's going to appear very small. At perigee, when the moon is in those closest positions, the moon, that's when we have these super moons where the moon is really, really big in the sky. Um, so apogee and perigee, and then all of the phases of the moon and waxing and waning is your vocabulary for the week. Um, when I meet with you guys next week, we're going to do some notebooking, and I'm going to show you how to do this on a diagram, and then we're also going to jump into eclipses, which is some really cool stuff. But before I sign off and before we go, I do just want to say very quickly, I have to thank Ms. Paige Keeley for her book, Uncovering Student Ideas in Astronomy and the National Science Teachers Association. The Chinese moon activity that we did came from this book. And um, Ms. Keeley was so kind to um, give us a personal email and welcome us to use her material. So I just want to thank her for being very, very responsive and thank the um, National Science Teachers Association for doing such great work pu um, publishing awesome resources for teachers to use. Um, so I really appreciate them and uh, ask Paige Keeley to continue writing fantastic stuff for me to share with my students. Um, I want to ask you guys to do one more thing before I go. I want you to watch the moon this week. We just finished a quarter moon. A I'm sorry, we just finished a crescent moon the other night, and it was really, really clear and really, really easy to see. So at some point this week, no matter where you are, no matter what's going on, I want you to try to remember, Ms. Adams asked me to go outside and check out the moon. I want you to go out, look at it, see what you see. See which one of these moons we talked about that it is. And then I want you to go out and look again. Look again in a few nights. As scientists, one thing that we do is we look for change and we try to observe things. So what I want you to do is go look at the moon. As soon as you have a clear night, go out and look at it. If you're one of um, these artsy students who likes to draw, sketch it. Draw the moon. Think about um, the math of it. How much of that lit portion are you seeing? And then track it over the next few days and see what you come up with. Um, all right, guys, I am out of time. I enjoyed this past 30 minutes with you, and I look forward to seeing you next week where we do some notebooking, diagramming, and cover eclipses. Bye, guys.